This is Balkiri Bay near Ochen Cairn, which was once a hotbed of smuggling activity. Nearby on these cliffs is a rock that goes by the name of Adam's Chair. It was named after a local trader who used to sit on it to signal to the smuggling ships sailing along the Solway. Most smuggling activity, for obvious reasons, was conducted at night. So to be able to know where to land safely with their smuggled cargoes, the smugglers relied on friendly locals to guide them into harbour with signals. The ships would weigh anchor and load their cargo onto rowing boats that would then be offloaded onto the beach. The beach would become a furious hive of activity with locals in their droves and smugglers all pitching in together to get the goods onto pack horses and off of the beach before the excise men could arrive. Columns of pack horses, sometimes led only by a smart, well-trained grey pony, would leave the beach and swiftly make their way onto Glasgow or Edinburgh with their goods. Smuggling was a massive business in those days, with a surprising air of respectability. The duty put on hops for home brewing made drinking smuggled alcohol cheaper than home brew. In spite of the illegality of smuggling, many companies were established with HQs in Edinburgh to take advantage of this highly profitable business. Properties all along the Sol Solway coast were purchased by these companies and massive renovations and even entire new builds were done to make cellars in which to hide smuggled goods. Balkeri House, which is now a hotel, was purchased by the Manx Smuggling Company who extended the cellars and added access to the beach. Balkeri Bay and the surrounding Stewartry coastline were popular places to moor your smuggling ship and offload your goods. Captain Yawkins of the Black Prince seemed to have a particular fondness for the stretch of coastline. Yawkins was something of a character and legend has it that he had made a deal with the devil for the safety of his ship, hence its rather ominous name. There's a number of swashbuckling stories attached to Yawkins too. For example, one day he was trying to land his ship and cargo when two revenue cutters, the Dwarf and the Pygmy, appeared, heading straight for him. Undeterred, Yawkins sailed his ship straight between them, close enough, they say, to toss his hat on the deck of one and his wig on the deck of the other. Then he hoisted a cast to his main top to show the excise ships that he was a smuggler before outrunning them. Yawkins at once also anchored his ship at Manxman's Lake by Mute Hill. An exciseman mistook it for a timber ship and boarded alone. Yawkins and his crew sailed off with the exciseman still aboard all the way to Amsterdam. For his lack of guile, the exciseman had to find his own way home to Galloway from the Netherlands. The Isle of Man on a clear day is quite visible from many points along the Solway. In 1735, James II, Duke of Athol, became Lord of the Isle of Man. His royal charter gave him exemptions from duties paid elsewhere in the British Isles. The island became a popular stopping off point for ships sailing to Liverpool, Glasgow and other ports on return from the Americas because without those duties they could actually make more from their cargo selling them to smugglers on the Isle of Man than at their intended destinations. One young man from Ramsey in the north of the island once took it upon himself to smuggle some bags of salt to help pay for his impending marriage. On the eve of the wedding, in defiance of the advice of relatives, he sailed with his soon-to-be brother-in-law to Colvend, which is over there. As they, sail, as they travelled up the Solway, a cutter named Prince Edward Augustus ordered them to lay to with a megaphone. Pre pretending not to understand English, the Manxmen continued towards their landing spot at Porter Warren. They had hardly gone any distance though, when the cutter fired and killed the bridegroom. The bride's brother panicked, put in at Colvend and took flight. Their boat was towed back to the customs house at Kirkcubri. The bridegroom's body was first buried near the shore where shipwrecked sailors had previously been buried, then moved on the sheriff's order to Colvend Kirkyard. The brother-in-law made it back to the Isle of Man where the bride-to-be and the family were devastated by the news. The bridegroom's father and the bride-to-be decided that the bridegroom's body must be brought back to the Isle of Man. So, along with her brother and other relatives and friends of the deceased, they made their way to Colvend to retrieve it. After obtaining permission to exhume him, they returned back towards Ramsey. 
they had gotten no farther than Heston Island when a storm blew up and claimed the small ship entirely with absolutely no survivors. As a footnote to that tragedy, Sir John Reid, the commander of the Prince Edward Augustus, was actually charged with the murder of the Manxman, but was acquitted at the High Court in Edinburgh.